Hi, I'm Chris Maddock, designer of the Harmony House. So, would you describe yourselves as green individuals? I don't think we were particularly green until we met Chris <laughs> and his team, actually. And uh, we're gradually becoming, I think, like, like a lot of Canadians, a lot more aware and conscious. Yeah, uh, green building, I think, is one of the hottest uh, topics nowadays in building industry. Not only in Canada, I think it's everywhere. For example, in China, when, when I go to China, you can see Shentai uh, Jianzhu is the meaning of green building everywhere. There's a number of green building rating systems that have been developed globally, and I think one of the things you have to remember is that it needs to address fundamentally four issues. It needs to address energy efficiency, it needs to address the environmental impact of building materials, and it needs to address water consumption and indoor air quality. If it addresses all of those adequately, then it's an excellent starting point for developing the design of a green building. How far can you push the design and operation of any, really anything uh, in the built environment from a building to a renovation uh, to actually a whole neighborhood or, or even uh, a landscape uh, project? And how far can you push it in terms of performance uh, and other issues to really get to as close to possible to a truly sustainable uh, level of performance, uh, heading towards, as we describe it, heading towards uh, a restorative response. And that really is asking the question of how do we build in a way that, uh, that would be in uh, alignment with how nature builds things. And, and I, what I often like to describe is imagine comparing uh, a building to a plant or a flower. And if you think about both of them, what they have in common is that they're both literally and figuratively rooted to place. So the, the flower can't get up and walk around to get what it needs. It has to get all of the energy that it needs to operate from, from the sun, from the amount of solar energy that it can harvest. It has to get all of its water needs from the amount of precipitation that falls uh, on the few square inches of soil that it can harvest from as well. And it has to, to pr process that water and in doing so uh, with it in terms of its own waste, it can't pollute its immediate environment or it actually kills itself. Um, so it has to be completely non-toxic in, uh, in its operations. And if you think about a, a flower or a plant, they're also habitat for um, other organisms, plant, uh, insects and microorganisms, just like our buildings are, are really habitat for us. And they're comprised of the most integrated, uh, elegant systems uh, on the planet. So they open and close, they track the sun, um, they respond actively to temperature and humidity. And, and what's very important is that they are they're literally meant to be in the place that they're in. They fit in the place that they're in. And that's really important um, for our buildings to, to really belong in the places uh, that, that they're in. And I think the, the punchline for us is at the same time that they do all these things, uh, plants are beautiful, flowers are beautiful. And so too should our buildings. And imagine if we were, if everything that we built in our cities and our communities um, were, were, that, um, were that integrated, were that successful, and we would have, uh, you know, an architecture uh, worth having. Certainly efficient design is one way to achieve a green building. To achieve maximum efficiency of the design, both the components of the home and the good behaviors of the occupants must work together to ensure the house runs as efficiently as possible. By using less energy, water, and materials, homeowners will benefit from saving energy, money, and achieving a more green building. Hi, I'm Ken Melamed, and we're at the Lost Lake Passive House, 
which during the 2010 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games was uh, the host uh, venue for Aust the Austrian teams. Uh, it's one of the most fun legacies that has come from the game and is so consistent with our intention to, to be leaders and innovators uh, to addressing some of the global challenges uh, and bu building more responsible construction types. So we're really, really excited to be able to showcase this technology uh, and maybe see it uh, spread across Canada. There's already been uptake. One of our local builders, uh, Durfeld Construction, uh, is going to start building these homes uh, in Whistler and hopefully uh, across the province. Hi, I'm Bob Deeks. I'm the owner and president of RDC Fine Homes. We're uh, based locally here in Whistler, British Columbia. We are a builder and a residential renovator. And we are standing in front of uh, a home that we built about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's unique to the corridor. It's a rammed earth house. Welcome, come on in. Um, this is a great example of uh, the beauty of rammed earth. These are rammed earth columns. They're 18 inches thick and they have five inches of uh, insulation in the middle. So we get a great mass wall assembly that is thermally broken with some high performance uh, mineral based insulation. Rammed earth is sustainable in that it uses very, very little concrete uh, powder, Portland cement, as compared to a concrete wall. So if you're looking for a stone assembly or a mass wall such as this, this is a great way to go. Now this home uh, it will be built green uh, and I can point out a number of things that really fit this into that built green philosophy. We had a specific focus to the building envelope. Uh, we tested this house when it was finished at below one air change per hour, which is uh, very exciting for us. Very difficult to build a timber house like this and uh, build an airtight envelope like that. So we have great insulation values in the walls, we have an airtight building envelope, and then we tried to bring some materials here that would really speak to sustainability. So if you look at the floors, we did polished concrete floors throughout. So the structural floor uh, that would be in place anyway was polished to become the finished surface. Some other interesting things, if you look at the stairs, uh, that's a, a Carrera marble. That was sourced uh, as a recycled product. Um, story says that it came off the Brentwood Mall and was actually quarried in Nanaimo, BC. So not only were we able to source material locally, but we were also able to get a beautifully reclaimed product that uh, is a stunning addition to the house. And let's go on upstairs. We do uh, a lot of our own design and we have a particular focus to passive solar design. Although this lot wasn't perfectly situated, we do have a southwest exposure. And so we designed the house as a passive solar house as best we could. And some of the things that we did to uh, accommodate that is we used double glazed uh, windows on the front face to maximize our solar gain in the winter time. And we used triple glazed windows everywhere else. The windows uh, are a special feature of this house. We used a local company based out of Abbotsford called Cascadia uh, Window. They are fiberglass frames and as far as we can tell uh, for a locally sourced window this is the highest performing window product that is available to us in British Columbia. Some other really cool things, uh, all the timber that you see in here and it's a beautifully designed and executed timber home, uh, the timber was all sourced from standing deadwood in the central part of BC. So we were not only able to source our material locally, but we were able to get sustainably harvested material. Uh, the offcuts from the timbers were used for the decking and then uh, the material was high graded and the majority of the trim that you see on the baseboards and around the doors uh, was the high grade material that came off the milling of the timber. In, uh, in designing a passive solar house, one of the other things that you really want to bring uh, to the project is natural daylighting and so as you can see as we walk around this house even though it's quite uh, overcast outside uh, the house is beautifully lit and there is no need to turn any of the lights on during the day. Uh, one of the other things that we focused on in terms of trying to build a sustainable house is the maintenance uh, that everybody has to engage with on a daily basis with their home so certainly the concrete floors uh, speak to that extremely durable, easy to keep clean. And then we did some specific things with the exterior of the building. We used uh, a material um, that is manufactured down in Seattle out of recycled paper called paper stone for the burgundy accents on the house. Very, very durable, will never need to be repainted or recoated. And then we used a cedar siding product that is locally sourced and we stained it a, a black. 
So it will just gently fade over time to uh, a, a, a lighter charcoal shade. And again, uh, something that over time really should never have to be uh, repainted or restained. We put in really deep overhangs around the house, one to shade the windows. So in the summertime, we don't get that overheating effect, but also to try and protect the timber work that is a key element uh, on the architectural side of the house so that those timbers will only have to be refinished uh, infrequently over time. What was a bit of a challenge for us is that we had to come up with many of these ideas ourselves and this is actually what the lead system, um, how it served us very well is because it's effectively a bit of a checklist mm -hmm. that you can follow when you're trying to decide as a consumer what features and what attributes do you want to bring into your house. It's hard to know when you're not specialists in building and you're certainly not a specialist in green building. So we found being able to, being guided by lead to be able to choose and also to be able to make some of those trade-offs that are necessary if we're going for this credit and not for that credit, which ones are the most important to us as homeowners and which ones are, um, do we want to feature in, in terms of um, modeling some of the green practices. So we found that to be a very useful kind of device to help yeah, us yeah. prioritize our issues. Yeah, the checklist approach, I mean, it, it teaches you an awful lot about what, um, what, what some of the important parts of green building are and it also gives you enough information that you can navigate your way through the various trade-offs. Um, and I, I think that both of us found that that was one of the, the very powerful parts of this whole process. So let's talk about solar energy. Solar energy is available to us in two forms. Direct sunlight and indirect thermal energy radiated from various surfaces that are struck by direct sunlight. The most common use of direct energy or direct sunlight is through photovoltaic arrays, which convert the sun's energy into electricity. The second form of the sun's energy is thermal energy, or heat, which may be captured by things like your south-facing windows, air source heat pumps, solar hot water heaters, and especially Earth's land and large bodies of water, all of which are effective ways of gathering the thermal component from the sun's rays. The process is, uh, is not that e uh, easy, but when you complete the work and the work is good, you know, the satisfaction that you have is nothing can match th to that. Uh, it's not only the benefit for us uh, individual that I have, I feel the satisfaction, but because of the, our experience, the product can sold uh, to, the, to the industry, this sort of uh, technology is feasible, it can be done. Uh, in the project. Therefore, more and more people will be willing to use this sort of new technology or, or equipment uh, for the industry, which can also improve our industry, also to move ahead and forward and forward.